Welcome back to the True Crime Lounge Podcast <clears throat> here on Spotify and YouTube. I do have a Patreon that you can go and join for early access to episodes scheduled to come out. I also have a merch shop that y- you can get yo for your true crime gear. For any update on my channel or podcast, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Now, with that being said, why don't we dive into today's episode, shall we? Today we are going to be talking about this, talking about the case of Lauren Ron. This case happened in Manchester, New Hampshire, in 1980. She was last seen April 26 at that at the apartment in the company of two friends. When her mom returned home that evening, she had to she had to grope for the door because all of the tight all of the light bulbs in the hallway had been unscrewed. When she entered the apartment, she checked out Lauren's room and she appeared to be asleep in her bed. The next morning, she realized the body she had seen in the bed was actually one of Lauren's friends. That in the in that friend was clueless as to Lauren's whereabouts. Did I say Lauren Con- I meant Lauren. I'm sorry. Um Lauren um, authorities treated Lorraine's case as a runaway, but details emerged in October of that year that cast a very different light on the case. Her mom, Judith, noticed three calls to a California number on the phone bill and that she knew she didn't make. One was a sexual assistance call for teenagers held by a doctor's wife who took in runaways. Could Lorraine be there? The second number was a motel ran by a child pornographer by a pseudonym named Dr. Z, but unfortunately, authorities were un- unable to connect the 14-year-old's disappearance to either of these people. Now, to this day, what, beca- what has become a Lorraine Rand ha- remains a mystery. Who was Lorraine Rand? For more than four decades, her disappearance has puzzled anyone who investigated with a new piece of information, there is only more, there are only more questions. Did she run away? Was she abducted or trafficked? Um, is her case connected to the missing a local woman or her serial killer neighbor? In this episode, we're going to be examining all the mysterious clues and theories, hopefully drawing drawing everyone one step closer to a resolution. Maureen was born April 3rd, 1966, in Manchester, New Hampshire. Her mom, Judith Swanson, and her unnamed father divorced when Maureen was an infant. Judith's parents lived in Hollywood, Florida for a time, and Judith took Maureen to live in the neighboring Miami in 1970. When they moved back to Manchester six years later, when Maureen was 10, they will rent the third floor unit of a triple decker apartment building on 289 Merrimack Street. Manchester is a New Hampshire's is New Hampshire's largest city, a little more than an hour's north of Boston, which is the population of about 9,000, or Lorraine lived there. It was built around the Merrimack River that runs through downtown and like any other city. Manchester has seen its ups and downs. And the air- so, the area where Lorraine lived, just east of the river, sometimes described as a rough one. So the industrial working class home also, was also to, home to a serial killer by the name of Terry Ross Mutant, whose case um, is a very interesting one, I will say that. So, let's connect some point connections to Lorraine's case. Um, in the spring of 1980, Lorraine was an 8th grader at Parkside Junior High and getting good grades. Judith had 11, 11 siblings, so Lorraine had quite a few aunts and uncles, aunts in the area, who would help take care of her. They said Lorraine was having troubles running with the wrong crowd, spending a lot of time in the streets, smoking weed and drinking alcohol. Judith said that she and Lorraine argued like a normal mom and teen daughter, but her close, they had a close relationship overall. 
On Saturday, April 26, 1983, three weeks after Lorraine's 14th birthday, Judith left to attend a tennis match out of town with her boyfriend, which was a normal excursion since Judith's boyfriend was a professional tennis player. L Usually, Lorraine joined her mother on these day all day outings, but she asked to stay at home this time, and Judith agreed. That morning was the last time Judith would see her daughter. Family members popped popped in throughout the day to check in on Lorraine, and she left the apartment at least once to go to a corner store, a popular hangout shop for local teenagers. So, lo some of Lorraine's friends would later tell her mom that they saw her restocking beer and wine coolers that day. And Judith also thinks that she did that in exchange for purchasing alcohol underage. Can't do that now, but, um, I mean, you could, but... It's, pro it's not legal. Anyway, um, she Judith would also go on to say people were, were more were more appoint apartment or more appoint apt to look the other way, reflecting on her attitude toward her teens drinking. Later that evening, Lorraine entertained two friends at her apartment: one male, the other female. And it was funny that the three friends drank a total of six beers and one bottle of wine throughout the night. Uh, recently, Lorraine's aunt, um, Jo Beth, told a, lo told a local news outlet that the female friend was Lorraine's age with the male friend who was about 21. About seven years older than the girls. The law enforcement had never revealed identity and ages of the two friends who were with Lorraine that night. What about her last known movements? Um, about at about twelve thirty a.m., her friends said that they heard saw loud noises in the hallway and assumed that it was Lorraine's mom returning home. Wanting to avoid trouble, Lorraine's male friend stuck out the snuck out the back door, and he later told the police that he had heard Lorraine look lock the back door behind him after that. And police never considered the man to be a suspect in her disappearance. But they did share exactly why he was cleared. They haven't shared why he was cleared. Five years later, in 1985, the same man committed suicide. According to Lorraine's family, Manchester police shared with them that his suicide note said he can't shake it anymore. They are suspicious that his suicide might be related to her case. Despite the official clearance, did he feel guilty because... He did something to her, or know about what happened to her. One of her neighbors also heard voices approaching her um, at the apartment at 12.30 a.m. at the night she was missing, as well as some sound of someone leaving the back stairs, and then silence. Maureen's friend said that they won't to, went, to, went to sleep in Lorraine's bed after they realized the noises weren't her mom coming home. Shortly after lying down, Lorraine went to sleep in the living room and the sofa instead. What about the horrific homecoming? Well, most sources state that she returned home with her boyfriend around 1.15 a.m. about 45 minutes after the noises Lorraine's neighbor, friends and neighbors heard. At least one source has her arriving about 12.45, a half hour sooner. Judith immediately felt uneasy and climbed the three flights of stairs to her top floor apartment as the hallways were pitch black. She would later discover that the light bulbs had been unscrewed from their sockets. Judith's concern increased when she fell to her front door in law. She went to straight to Lauren's, Lorraine's bedroom. Why did I keep wanting to say Lauren? Not Lorraine. I don't know why. Anyway, she went straight. Th um, she went to Lorraine's bedroom. Saw she was a saw a sleeping figure, and assuming in the darkness it was her daughter. Any relief that she felt was short lived when her boyfriend noticed that the back door is open. Judith immediately wrote Lorraine to, Lorraine to question her, only to discover that it was Lorraine's friend, and she told Judith that Lorraine should be sleeping on the couch. Was sleep should be sleeping on the couch but was too drunk to remember anything that happened. The search would begin. Judith and her boyfriend 
rushed through the apartment looking for Lorraine of any sign of where she could be. Nothing indicated a struggle took place. Nothing was missing. Lorraine's purse, money, and clothing, and all of the other personal belongings were still there. Next, Judith Cattle began called her family and friends to see if Lorraine was with them. Lorraine was to type was to tie to always leave a note or always communicate her whereabouts. Somehow, but rather than let her mom worry, having turned up, having turned up nothing, Judith, um, her boyfriend, and local family members began driving around the streets of Manchester and search for Lorraine. In about three forty-five a.m., she saw she made the police down, flagged him over to report her daughter missing. Lorraine was a small girl, just five four, ninety pounds, with brown or auburn hair and blue eyes. On the day she went missing, Lorraine had been wearing a white v-neck sweater and a pair of blue plaid um, blouse underneath the jeans, brown shoes, and a heart-shaped ring, and a silver blue necklace. Authorities have DNA and dental records available. To date, her, Lorraine's profile has been compared to at least 20 Jane Doe bodies without, um, finding, without finding a match. Was she a runaway? For the first for the first several weeks, the Manchester police believed that she that she was a runaway who was soon returned. They saw a teenage daughter of a single mom who had fallen into the city's rougher crowd who struggled to adjust. Um, Judith admitted that Lorraine hated to be back in New Hampshire. And still Lorraine's family insisted that she was a good kid in a rough patch who had no reason to disappear. And if she had planned on running away, why would she leave all the things she needed behind? Now, here's the official theory, is that in that change as the weeks and months dragged on with no sign of her, other than a few unconfirmed sightings, but the police became to believe that she stepped out of her apartment voluntarily and planned to return quickly, but was met with, it, met with foul play. Manchester Detective Lieutenant Tony Prowler, who retired in 2000, believes that at least one person interviewed early on didn't share anything. They, they, everything they know about Lorraine's disappearance. He would go on to say that I still believe that some acquaintances of hers knows what happened to her that day. Frustrated with the lack of leads and the finding, feeling that like her daughter was being treated as a one runaway instead of an endangered child, Judith called the FBI in Concord. They couldn't help her, citing no evidence of kidnapping. However, the agent um, Judith spoke with referred her to two former FBI agents turned private investigators. She hired them, but the trail went cold, cold for them after a few months. Judith committed consulted psychics and considered any theory that came her way accepting whatever help she could find she could get by finding her daughter so then there was this thing about california calling well investigators biggest lead came from the surprise source in november 1980 about six months after she disappeared the source was judith's october phone bill on which appeared to be three calls to and from numbers in California that Judith did not recognize. All three calls were placed on October 1st, 1980, within 10 to 15 minutes of each other. She was, she was confused. She had no connection to California, um, but, she was hopeful, but she was convinced that all these calls had something to do with her daughter. Lorraine loved to sing and dance and had dreams of becoming an actress. In like the warm weather whenever she lived in like the warm weather whenever she lived in Florida. In a slim chance that she had planned to run away, Judith thought going to California made some sense. At the same time, one could charge payphone calls to a home phone service provided by making a third party. And this was at this time now. And to do that, you would have to know the phone home number to the bill, depending on the provider. You may also need a phone card with a unique code or, or a pen. 
to authorize the charge before the call would go through. It was possible, but not common, again, it's possible, but not common, for scammers to charge calls to random phone numbers. After reporting the phone calls to the police, Judith would then tell them that that she held tell then told him that she was heading to California to search for Lorraine. Police advised her not to, still working on the runaway theory. They reasoned that Lorraine might not contact her mom around the holidays, and that they also needed to investigate the calls further. They determined that the two of the calls were from a payphone outside of Santa Monica Hotel. Um, Santa Monica Hotel to to a hotel in Santa Ana. The call, the third call, was a payphone across the street from Santa Monica where, Motel, where the first calls originated from, and the destination of a teen hotline based in Westminster. Santa Ana and Westminster are neighboring California towns, about one hour's drive from Santa Monica, and a physician answered the hotline phone number, but denied any knowledge of Laureen or the October 1st phone call. What about a silent caller? In 1981, Judith began receiving suspicious phone calls at her home, always around 3.45 p.m., and usually um, more than often around Christmas time, unfortunately. There's not a lot of details about where the calls or originated um, when they were made and or exactly how many times they were. The caller never spoke and he call and his calls don't didn't stop until Judith moved to Florida in the late nineteen eighties and changed the phone number. At least one of the family members and one of her childhood friends of Lawrence received strange calls that they believe were from her. Oddly, Detective Lucas Hobbs, my mind's going to Fast and the Furious when I hear that now. Anyway, back to the case, um, before we go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> um, Detective Luke Hobbs currently assi- was currently assigned, to, currently assigned to Manchester um, coal cases, says that none of these phone calls are in the police file from Laureen's case. He, surmi- he surmises that Judith's private PI looked into these calls, and didn't share their findings with the Manchester police at the time. Yet, local newspapers reported on the mysterious phone calls back in the 1980s, stating that Judith informed the police in Manchester's follow-up with the lease. Was she a tra- so was she a trafficking victim? Well, there was, little, there was a little activity go on for Lorraine's case until 1985 when a youth advocate, Carol Jensen, either offered or agreed to help. Carol is the founder of Wings for Children, an organization that provides transportation and other services to children in need, especially those experiencing abuse. Carol obtained, obtained a hotline number from Judith's 1980 phone, call, phone bill and called it. The hotline was still active and... The same physicians answered. So, with this passage of time, the doctor was calling to provide a little more detail, was willing to provide a little more detail, but only raised suspicions. He claimed that he was a plastic surgeon regarding the phone call associated with Lorraine's disappearance. Yes, he and his wife occasionally helped young women, many of them runaways, and yes, he vaguely remembered a girl from New Hampshire visiting them around the time Maureen went missing. So, when Carol Jensen passed him, asked, pressed him for information, he told her that a woman named Annie Sprinkle might know more. Annie was a pornographic actress at the time, pursuing a career in sex education. One unsustained situation theory at the time was that Annie, in coordination with the doctors and his wife, might have helped Lauren break into the porn industry underage, similar to what happened to Tracy Lawrence at the same age in the area in 1984. All of this information is missing from, from the police um, office file, official file. Now, the doctor is running the hotline. His wife and the hotline itself was never identified. It looks like he's never been cleared or investigated further. I really think they should investigate this more. Um, I really do. 
Um, however, it appears that someone took looked into Annie Sprinkle, whether it was a Manchester police, Carol Jensen, or or maybe Judas P.I., and determined that she wasn't connected to Lorraine's disappearance. In 1986, Carol Jensen located the California motels from Judas Swanson's 1980 telephone bill. Telephone bill. Rumor had it Mantua Dr. Z used the Santa Monica location um, to film child pornography. Virtually all sources that mention Dr. Z say that he never confirmed to be the same man in the hotline. A few more recent articles state that Judith and her PI believe that the hotline doctor, Dr. Z, were one and the same. And for now, this is yet another mystery in this very puzzling case. Like, I want to know what happened. Like, someone knows something, they're not saying anything. Like, I wonder if Judith is still alive. Um, I pray she, every day, I pray that she is still alive. I really do. So, there was a continued search, and most of Lorraine's family firmly believed that it, she is still alive, especially after the strange phone calls. For Judith, she says it's mo her mother's instinct that she's never, ever felt her passed away in her heart. She's convinced that the three California calls from Lorraine indicate that her daughter was alive at least a few months before she disappeared. Maybe Lorraine didn't have money to place the calls, or she was giving her mother a clue to her whereabouts. Whenever Lorraine's family gives an interview as to the anniversary of her disappearance, um, they address her as well as the public, and they hope that she hears their words and remembers that she is still loved. Judith maintains that Lorraine simply didn't want to rave. She believes that she, she believes she can't she can't believe she would never contact me is where it hurts the most. So, in spite of the apparent missteps, it seems that the Manchester police have been just as determined to find Lorraine, and the police captured at the time of the, her disappearance, Ken Murray, looked into Lorraine's own his personal time, often accompanied by his wife. After he retired, Ken Murray said that Lorraine's disappearance was one of the voids in his life. And someday before I die, I hope somebody finds the answer. He continued to his personal search until his death in 1995. There are some loose ends. So, since there's so much that we st really don't know about this case, and won't know as long as it's an open investigation, there are dozens of theories that happened to Lorraine, after researching this case and finding a lot of theories, there's some things that, there's some key points and burning questions. One of them is two, two friends who were, the two friends that were with Lorraine that night, especially because one of the, some of them, Lorraine's family later investigated that the two. Lorraine disappearing the first time, she chose not to go out of town with her mom is quite a coincidence, leading people to believe, leading to believe that she either planned to leave that day or that the person who took her knew they had opportunity. The phone calls Lorraine's families received over the years could have been from a sick prankster, um, Lorraine or a person who who took her. If it was Lorraine, as many of her family members believe. Then they should. They didn't. Then why didn't she speak to them when they picked up? The only reason that is a really good one is that they wanted reassurance that the family was still out there and was too ashamed of her of what happened and afraid that it wouldn't happen or it reveal itself. Okay, here's another good question: Who was Lorraine's father? Why wasn't he discussed or considered a suspect? From what we know is that Lorraine was struggling to adjust and wanted to leave Manchester. And we don't know if she wanted to reconnect with her father, if he kidnapped her, whether, he, whether she went willingly or not. He might have been isolated and threatened her about staying in touch with her family. I mean, it, it, 
you could see Lori's friend covering for her if she thought Lori was choosing to go with her dad. Another one. Um, and finally, why aren't the police calls and information about the hotline doctor in the official police file? Even though it was bungled back in the 80s, it ha has been reported for 40 years. And the family should be included and officially investigated by now. In 1984, there was the let's, let's jump to 1984 with Shirley McBride. And as we, as we go through various theories, we must remember that Lorraine, Lorraine Ron's disappearance night might not be an isolated incident. The Oak Hill, the Oak Hill Research Blog analyzed a numerous amounts of unsolved cold cases in the region. The two have a striking links to the circumstances in Lorraine's disappearance. The first look we'll take is 15, well, the first look I'm going to look at is going to be 15 year old Shirley McBride. And she was last seen about 9.30 p.m. on Friday, July 13, 1984. Leaving her apartment that she shared with her old assistant in Concord, New Hampshire, like Lorraine's, police theorized that Shirley was a runaway, even though she had all her clothes and money and personal belongings behind, behind her. Shirley's family accused the police of not uh, investigating her case fully because of negative, negative perception of her. Like Lorraine, Shirley stated that um, having family problems leading up to her disappearance, like hanging out in a rough crowd who introduced her to drugs, alcohol, and dangerous situations. Lorraine was living on the west side of Manchester, and when the problem stayed, started about two miles from her apartment, Lorraine was three years older, but it was considered to, that the two girls knew each, of each other and had mutual friends. The prime suspect in Shirley's case, which is now being treated as a homicide investigation, is Walter Davis. He died in 2003. In 1984, Walter was then 26, lived with the family in Merrimack, and often stayed with his father in Concord. In July 1984, after Shirley went missing, his family caught him trying to burn a woman's bib overalls and cotton shirt. Not suspicious at all, right? He confessed that he had raped a girl and discarded her body in the river, prompting the family to turn the clothing over to the police. Walter told detectives that he, um, That Walter told the detectives that he came across the, the clothing by chance and brought him home for his brought him home for his sister. Yeah, I'm not buying that one minute. Sorry. So not sorry actually. Investigators collected the DNA from Shirley's family to test against the clothing and evidence, but there is no word on the results. Shirley's family says that the police privately told Walter Davis it was the prime suspect. It was public, publicly pushing a one away theory. Her family doesn't know if the police ever looked, searched for in the river for her remains. If Walter was responsible, was he also, was he Shirley's only victim? Another case is in 19A with Denise Denault. Denise Denault lived in an apartment just two blocks from Maureen Run and disappeared six weeks after her. It was about 1.30 a.m. on a Sunday on June 8, 1980, just days for her 26th birthday. Two men who were talking, who talked to Denise when she was leaving her downstairs apartment, downstairs Manchester club, now, yeah, leaving a downtown Manchester club that night, and she said that she was headed to a party at her housing project on Manchester's west side in a neighborhood known as Rock Rimmon. This, um... It's the same area as now Shirley McBride lived in at the time, and him and from Maureen Ron's apartment. Denise's roommate insisted that it was highly unusual to leave without notifying someone, and when she would never leave her children alone, some theorized that she accidentally overdosed at the party she attended. Police officials stance on these cases, there is no evidence to support the theory of foul play. 
Now, when her dis when she disappeared, Denise, experiencing custody issues of her twenty six year old with her twenty six year old husband, ex ex husband Paul Denault. Over the four four year and six year old son, some are suspicious of Paul, citing financial motives from the divorce and child custody battles. Paul's history of drug dealing could also play a role in what happened to Denise. In nineteen eighty in nineteen ninety nine, he was arrested for the largest heroin bust in the history of Manchester. He was still living in her apartment at the time, having moved in after she disappeared. Yeah, we know yeah. Um, let's move on to the chameleon killer. There wasn't much improvement on Denise's case until law enforcement discovered a serial killer, Terry Rossman, who was living a few doors down from the Manchester, from her in Manchester when she went missing. He was also using the alias Bob Evans, and as an unidentified spouse, at least for a period of time, we known as Elizabeth Elizabeth Evans. In 2016 and 2017, DNA connected Rossman to the bodies discovered at near nearby Allenstown, New Hampshire, back in 1985. And also in 2017, the police will receive a tip to search the woods behind the Kimball Street housing project where Denise was headed to the night she went missing. All three cadaver dogs used to search focused in the single site and the woods for a few hundred yards down on the incline. Digging commercials, digging com commenced, and search ended in two days. Police returned to the same area six months later, but haven't revealed if they discovered any evidence during our search. There are many connection, curious connections here. First of all, In the in that search area was Shirley McBride's neighborhood until she moved in 1983. Even stranger is when is that Kimball on Kimball Street. And then Rosman moved to California at the Manchester. He changed his name to Curtis Kimball. And what do we? And we know he was in California by March 1984, and at least three months before Shirley went missing, but. Was it a coincidence? Could it still indicate? Could this be an indication of a connection between Denise and Rossman? The New Hampshire Attorney General's office insisted at the time of the searches there is no evidence. There is no evidence connecting them. The now that doesn't stop people from speculating, though. Especially since the two were neighbors, and because Denise fit Rossman's profile of a newly single mom who could use a helping hand? Here's the question. Could Rossman have, could Rossman have anything to do with Laureen Rand's disappearance? He would have been about 37 when she went missing in 1980. He would have seen the last area around Thanksgiving um, in 1981 with Denise um, Buden. And Laureen lived a couple of blocks from Rossman. And her apartment was on the, his way to work. Laureen's grandparents on her mom's, on Judith's side, lived in Allenstown near the state park where Rossman disposed of his victims' bodies. Judith, also a single mom, said Denise... Desna and her daughter even looked alike, despite their age difference. Here's an, and there's also an odd connection in California. Thinking back to October 1st, 1980, phone calls Lauren rece Laureen received. Um, Rossman was in La Point, in California in the, in the fall of 1978 with Morley's Honey Church before relocating to New Hampshire. And LaPierre is about a half hour from Santa Ana in Westminster, California. And an hour outside Santa Monica. When Terry resurfaced in, Lo in Los Alamatos, California in 1984, he was only 10 minutes from east of Westminster. 
four de- it's been four decades later at this point. It's been 43 years total since Ra- since Lorraine Ron had and Denise um Demont did not disappeared. Lorraine would be 57. Denise would be 69. Denise's two boys are in their late 40s now. Shirley McBride disappeared 39, 39 years ago, and she will be 54. Lorraine's mom, Judith, is now 77, retired and living in Florida, still searching for her daughter. Um, Shirley McBride's older sister, Robin, says that even though she has accepted her sister is dead, the need to find her and the team and to learn what happened Still, what happens still weighs on her. She will go on to say that somebody needs to know, and after that, after I go, I've got one brother, but there will be nobody else to look for her. If I don't keep pushing now, there is no one who is going to ask after that. It's important to me, and somebody needs to knows what happened to her. Uh, if anybody knows what happens or can be helpful, please send a tip, guys. Um, I pray that, that all victims are still alive, and that the police want to take this more serious, and the family take these cases more seriously. Um, but that's it for today's episode. I will see y'all next time. Y'all have a great day.